we will be hearing from the masters and their retreats about Nicholas Rohr, who we will be hearing from today as well. Nicholas Rohr was a world-renowned artist, archaeologist, author, scholar, lecturer, costume and set designer, poet, mystic, and explorer. He and his wife, Helena, during the early 20th century, were amanuenses for the ascended masters, El Moria and Maitreya. Nicholas ascended at the conclusion of that lifetime. His father wanted him to study law, but Nicholas wanted to pursue art. Now, he was born in St. Petersburg in Russia on 9th, October 9th in 1874. I want to share about what his name means. Nicholas means one who overcomes. Rory means rich in glory. So instead of doing what his father wanted, which was to study law, he wanted to pursue art. How he resolved the situation was by enrolling simultaneously in the law at the Faculty of Imperial University and also Imperial Academy of Arts. This is in Russia where he lived. In September of 1900, he went to Paris to study art. In the summer of 1901, Nicholas returned to St. Petersburg. In October, he married Helena Ivanova Shaposhnikova. Helen, Helena was an accomplished pianist and came to be regarded as a distinguished lady of letters and a prolific writer in the esoteric tradition of Eastern religion. She was his twin flame, an inspiration and a support to Nicholas throughout his life. They had two sons, George and Svetoslav. In the early 1900s, the Rorks traveled extensively throughout Russia and Europe. During these journeys, Professor Rorick painted, undertook archaeological, archaeological excavations, studied architecture, lectured, and wrote about art and archaeology. In 1907, he began applying his talents to stage and costume design. This became a fulfilling and successful career for Roy. He designed sets and costumes for Diaghilev's ballet and opera productions, including The Rite of Spring by Stravinsky and almost all of Wagner's and many of Rimsky-Korsakov's operas. At the invitation, the director of the Chicago Art Institute. Rohr came to the United States in 1920. He traveled widely, he lectured, exhibited his works. While in the United States, Rohr founded the Master Institute of United Arts, an international society of arts called Ardens, which means flaming heart. That's his life, the flaming heart and an international art center in New York called Corona Mundi, which means crown of the world. As a tribute to Rora, the Rora Museum was established in New York in 1923. Rora's artistic style is difficult to describe because as Claude Bragdon put it, he belongs to an elect fraternity of artists, including Da Vinci, Rembrandt, Blake, and the music Beethoven, whose works have, quote, a unique, profound, and indeed a mystical quality which differentiates them from their contemporaries, making it impossible to classify them in any known category or to align them with any school because they resemble themselves only like spaceless and timeless order of initiates, unquote. One of the goals of Rorick's lifelong pursuit of preserving the world's cultural heritage came to fruition in 1935 with the signing of the Rorick Pact Treaty. This was signed at the White House with the countries of the Pan-American Union representatives. 
Under the pact, nations of war were obliged to respect museums, universities, cathedrals, and libraries, as they did hospitals. Just as hospitals flew the Red Cross flag, cultural institutions would fly Rourke's banner of peace. This was a flag with a white field and three red spheres in the center, surrounded by a red circle. Rourke believed that protecting culture, the spiritual health of the nations, would be preserved. Rourke was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1929 and in 1935 for his efforts to promote international peace through art and culture and to protect our treasures in time of war. Throughout his life, Rourke found the time to be involved in a multitude of activities and to do them all well. His spiritual life was a wellspring from which his literary and artistic vision arose. In an article about the character and work of his father, Svetoslav Rorik summed up the artist's quest for inner spirituality. This is what he wrote. He was a great patriot and he loved his motherland, yet he belonged to the entire world. And the whole world was his field of activity. Every race of men to him was a brotherly race. Every activity, every country, a place of special interest and of special significance. Every religion was a path to the ultimate. And to him, life meant the great gates leading into the future. Every effort of his was directed for the realization of the beautiful and his thoughts found a masterful embodiment in his paintings, writings, and public life. Through all, this continuing the quote, through all his paintings and writings runs the continuous thread of a great message. The message of the teacher calling to the disciples to awaken and strive for a new life, a better life, a life of beauty and fulfillment. So that gives us an idea of who Nicholas Rohr was. Now, just before his dictation, we are going to be looking at this one. This was given in June of 1996. And for your reference, it's volume 46, number three of the Pearls of Wisdom. The messenger of Elizabeth Clare Prophet said, quote, Nicholas Rohr addresses the youth of every nation with the fiat, conquer self, and encourage them, encourages them to polish the components of self until the hum of the universe is intact within their chakras. So the footnote hum, this is Sanskrit. It's a seed syllable for manifestation. And the messenger Elizabeth Clare Prophet has can explain that the home of the universe is, this is quote, the power of God as above, so below, meeting in the heart. Let's take a look a little bit at what the master says in his dictation. I have indeed championed the cause of peace in many ways. And I must tell you, beloved, we must recruit many, many souls for the restoration of youth. And youth are the foundation of decades and centuries to come. I would speak then to all youth of the world. I would speak especially of those between the ages of 10 and 21. I say to you, beloved, these years of your life are years when you may squander a great deal of energy and what the scriptures call riotous living, which we heard from Luke about the riotous living. So he continues in another spot in this dictation. As you read the magazines, as you see what is happening in the colleges and universities and high schools of the nation, you come to realize that the imbibing of beer, alcohol, 
drugs, there, drugs, and every kind, stronger and stronger drugs that are killing the youth of the generation. Let me repeat that. All of these alcohol and drugs, they're stronger and stronger. They are killing the youth of the generation. So beloved, look at this and say to yourself, this was the quote from what a, a young person might say. I am in the prime of my youth. My sacred fire is with me in my chakras. I have a mission and a calling. I will not make this such and such karma and therefore take many years to pay the debts of my irresponsibility in youth. So here's a young person who's realizing that he doesn't want to get into that and that he is going to fulfill his mission and his calling. He realizes he has that sacred fire, that gift of God of the threefold flame of light. And he will not do these errors and pay the debts of his irresponsibility in his youth. There are keys that he gives us about how to conquer self. So he wants the youth to conquer self. And I would guess that we can also take these keys and utilize them. He gives keys not only in his dictation in 1996, but also in his dictation in 1990. This is Pearls of Wisdom, volume 33, number 44. So you can reference that as well. He says in that dictation in 1990, embrace then the work that is yours. And if you have lost the hours in not perfecting that work, oh, children of the sun, then go back to school. Find the best teacher in your field, but work to perfect your art, your science, your calling. Work to perfect your art, your science, your calling. Now, what is our calling? Our calling could be anything. You could be a teacher, you could be an artist, you could be a musician, you could be a philosopher, a counselor, whatever it is, that is our calling. And we want to perfect that calling. He says, feel very close to me in that moment, for I have made myself present just above the physical octave, desired to endue you and all who are responsive to the cord of my life with a greater light, a greater fire, a greater determination. Determination is one of those talents and gifts that Nicholas Roars demonstrates. He shows us how to accomplish anything and everything in life. Oh, my beloved, the great gift of the violet flame is also in my to impart to you. Let my students receive it, for it is indeed the means for the acceleration of the ascension process. Very important. So we have been working with the violet flame and he wants us to know that this is so important, that this is the means for the acceleration of ascension process. He had the ascension done. He, can, he fulfilled that. And he wants us to do so as well. It is Agni, is the fire of the greatest yogis. Now, Agni yoga is one of the things that he and his wife, they, they created a society of Agni yoga. And through that Agni yoga society, they put forth the leaves of Moya's garden and other writings and other contributions. So this is a key to Nicholas Rupert, Agni, the fire, the sacred fire. So important that we must develop this fire. We must nurture it and keep it blazing and blazing throughout all that we do. He continues, at no hour in the history of earth has its use been more necessary. This is about the violet flame 
to daily consume the sheer weight of negative karma that weighs heavily upon the disciple. For the disciple rises up the light, raises up the light, and therefore the light becomes a vortex into which the darkness rushes, desiring transmutation. So you can see the understanding here of how transmutation of darkness takes place. We use the violet flame and we use other methods to raise that light so that the light is a vortex. The darkness disappears into the light. He continues, there are things that cannot be put aside in light for they burn from within. They are the calling. And that calling must be secured. Everything must be sacrificed for it. This is stress. Everything must be sacrificed for it. And you must understand the inner and the outer calling. The outer calling cannot be successful, my beloved, without the inner calling being perfected. One moment. Now, Guruma in her teachings, as you will see, you have seen part of it and you will see the remainder of her teaching. She really puts a lot of emphasis on this. She talks about the inner calling, being the union with God, the use of the violet flame to transmit karma, love and serve one another and embrace the masters. So this is the most important that we fulfill our inner calling. And by fulfilling that inner calling, then we can manifest the outer calling. For the outer, this is Nicholas Rourke speaking here. For the outer calling is to demonstrate to the world the effects of what the inner light can be. The inner light complete can be. So this is such a, a determination that he had, that he made his ascension, and he wants all of us to be successful in this as well. He continues, choose your art well, perfect it well, for it is a requirement of the ascension that you fulfill your mission. I'll repeat that. For it is a requirement of the ascension that you fulfill your mission. So we must take this seriously. We're working on our union with God. We're working on fulfilling our mission, our contribution, all the things that we came here to do. Thus, he continues, remove yourself from the doodads of the world, from an encumbrance of things. Know the beauty of space and of emptiness that you might fill it with the master's light. It is so, beloved, it is so. And he continues, one such as I, came to embodiment to demonstrate the path of victory. So here we see another key, another key that we are using for our conquering of self. One such as I, that's himself, came to embodiment to demonstrate the path of victory in a Western and an Eastern sense of the Bodhisattva ideal. I came to give up myself to perfect the gift and to move on to where others also have need of me. He spoke during the dictation, one of his dictations, I am grateful to address you today to speak to you from the plane of the ascended masters that you might know that one from among you has graduated to this level and that you might accomplish the same. So we see how our ascension is so important that we must do this. And this is part of conquering self. He continues, never tire them in the work that is your dharma, your duty to be the wholeness of yourself. So that goes back to the dharma, our calling, our duty in life, what we do in life, how we manifest that inner light by our duty to be the wholeness of ourself. 
So he teaches by his own example, as he succeeded in making his ascension. He did many, many things. He was very competent in all of those things. That was part of his victory of being a conqueror of self. And he has in this dictation in 1996, more information he wants us to know. You know the children even below the age of 10 are finding cigarettes, finding drugs, are not being cared for by their parents or work or have single parents. Homes. Blessed ones, you cannot build a nation of children who are not with their mothers and fathers for at least a good deal of time, where they have that sense of inner and outer confidence, of independence, a sense of self-worth, a sense of reinforcement, a sense of their parents taking the child where he must go. So it's so important for children to develop that sense of self-worth of inner and outer confidence and reinforcement by their parents taking the child where he must go. He continues, parents do not fear to discipline your children for they will thank you many times over when they are past the years of so-called riotous living, those young years. They will thank you because they will not have squandered the light and lifeblood of their beings. So many young people today in the United States are losing the way. The institutions of learning do not support them. They have not learned how to read and write, whether in kindergarten, grammar school, junior high, high school. And by the time they go to college, they still can't spell and they can hardly read and write. It is a deplorable condition. Do you think that just happened? Well, I tell you. It did not just happen. It has been a plot of the force since the turn of the century and before to select those of elite parents, make them elitist, therefore allow them to rule other children who would receive a scrambled education and therefore could not compete. So he warns us about all this. This is going on today. This was going on in 1990 and 1996 and it's continuing today. He continues, this plot has gone on by the Luciferians and fallen angels in embodiment for more than a hundred years and in every nation. Yet America is the subject of the attack for these fallen ones who destroy America and save it only for the Nephilim and their offspring, those who have no light. So we are very much aware of this and we are putting a lot of energy and time into our decrees, our spiritual work and whatever else we can do to save America. He continues, I point out one thing to you that when St. Germain calls upon you and gives you a labor, gives you an assignment and you go after it and you accomplish it, you always win. You always win. You always succeed when you make up your mind that you have to devote the time, you have to devote your hearts and energy, you have to put many things aside for the saving of civilization itself. So he reminds us, we know how to do this. We've done it before because it's not just saving our youth, but the civilization we want to save our civilization too. He continues, hear the message of responsibility. Hear the message of responsibility. You may hear it again and again, beloved. You know your self-worth. You know what you have in this science and in this teaching. Understand there are very few like you on the face of the earth. The teachings must be spread abroad. They must be translated, but your focus must always be to the youth. Your focus must always be to the youth. Continues, so beloved, the messenger has seen this in South America, how the state of education in some countries goes down and down. Many children will never have an education 
at all because they are part of the homeless. We can see this all over the world. And in some countries, the homeless are a high percentage of the population in that country, more than half even. So you see, beloved, generations and generations of children with no education, no literacy. The messenger has spoken about this. She has given lectures from St. Germain in South America. This was back in the 90s as well. He continues, is this is the situation, beloved, as generations of children are disenfranchised, have no vote, no place to call their own, no station in life, no sense of worthiness, then what do they turn to? They will turn to war. They will turn to revolution. They will turn to upheaval of entire societies. For these children, will outnumber those who are the middle class and the wealthy, including all those with education. And so they do this today. And so their parents do also, who also have no education, had none before them. He continues, this is a vicious cycle. Where will it end? I tell you where it will end. It will end when you decide to become a saint not in heaven, but on earth. You decide to become a saint, not on heaven, but on earth. Because you have said, my heart goes out. I must put else aside. I must give my decrees, make my calls, help run the centers. And the very first priority thereafter is the children. Even the children that are unborn in the womb, even the children that are long before aborted, the children are our concern, the children beloved. He brings up the point of our own inner child because we all have an inner child. And sometimes it may be that we are not responding because our inner child is neglected. Beloved, because people are numb to the children, especially those who have committed abortions. It goes round and round. What will happen to the planet? These are the holy innocents, and God shall bring the judgment. Therefore, beloved, take the opportunity, take the opportunity to teach the children, even your neighbor's children next door. He says, whatever children, just take the time to teach some children. And then what will they have? They will have the sense of being a person. They have rights, they can vote, they can make the difference. And they will say to themselves, I will find my way through school. I will be there, I will be the exception. These driving spirits are indeed the exception. Most children need more help than simply being left somewhere to make it on their own. Care for the children, beloved, care for the children. Otherwise, you too may wind up with a karma of neglect of the children. May you go forth then and teach them. He goes on. Children are loving. They are grateful. They will thank you forever. He points out an example. Thousands of children, you know, maybe thousands of years later, you may meet someone on the, on the pathway on heaven and the heaven world, and they will say, thank you for helping me. On that day, you allowed me cause to become who I am. You allowed me to learn, make something of myself. You have a sense of dignity. I have a sense of dignity now. And you allowed me to contribute to society what you and God have given me. So this is any child, whether it's a relative, a neighbor, anyone who you meet, a student, any child that you can work with them, teach them, become intimate with them, support them, and show them the way, and help them gain confidence and abilities that they would not have otherwise had you not done this. He says, if this is the hour, the day of life of your ascension, then rescue life. Rescue life, I beg of you, for if you do not, 
this world may become a barren and bleak place and it will not be able to be turned around after a certain point. Very important. We have to do it now because we may lose the opportunity. This world would be a terrible place, barren and bleak, he describes. But he says, anything can happen on earth, beloved, but I ask you for this one focus, this is apart from education, to go after the aliens and fallen angels and their spacecraft, to do this fully armored with Archangel Michael's etheric sword and much decreed beforehand. We must purge the earth of the fallen angels and get on with the salvation of the sons and daughters of God. So this is very important. This is another topic because it's so important here. We have to go on with it be fully armored with Archangel Michael's sword and his light and his protection and purge the earth of these fallen angels, get on with the salvation of the sons and daughters of God. He ends this dictation, this 1996 dictation, where he says, I am Nicholas Rohr, your mentor of the spirit. Call to me. I await your calls. I will answer them as swiftly as Zanello answers your calls. And I tell you, I have been doing this since I realized that he was an important ascended master who had great teachings for us. And he is so sweet and loving and beautiful and helpful. He will help me in every way. <laughs> 